Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, we are so excited um, building anticipation for the last two years for this talk <laughs> with um, Noah Cohen, who is visiting us from St. Louis and Washington University. My name is Victoria Jackson. I am a sports historian and a clinical assistant professor of history in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. Um, this event that we're so excited for is also being live streamed everywhere around the world. Um, so hello, folks everywhere. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, and it is sponsored and hosted by the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. Um, what is very fun about our school is that we're made up by three units, history, philosophy, and religious studies, and sport is what brings us all together. There are other things, but I like to, to say that it's really sport that unites us, which is a, a fun thing to say as we're heading into March Madness, because if there's anything on a university campus that brings people together, it's watching basketball together and perhaps gambling on the outcome of those games and filling out brackets. Um, but what's super cool is that we have a university that likes to kind of defy historical disciplines, um, you know, interdisciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, new disciplines, blowing up of disciplines. And so we have this awesome thing, um, which is a sports humanities initiative here at ASU that is of course not exclusive to the humanities. We're friends with everyone. And in the work that we do in sports studies, we are friends with everyone. I think um, Dr. Cohen more so than anyone embodies that in the work that he does. And you'll be hearing more about that in a little bit. But um, my colleagues and shippers, Sean Klein, who's in philosophy, Terry Shoemaker, who's in religious studies, and I came together to say, let's build out super awesome sports humanities curriculum and create something for our undergraduate students to complement and enhance undergraduate kind of professional school degrees that are sport related, sports journalism, sports business, sports marketing, and inject some sport and society training into that. Um, I think every week, literally, we have world events that underscore the importance of understanding sports role in society, how sport is not um, kind of insular and protected and an escape from societal issues, but it carries them, it influences them, it reacts to them, it, it serves as a force to push things forward. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sports cancellation of Russia is the current example, but there are many, many every week <laughs> that exemplify this. Um, so we're really grateful and fortunate in shippers to have a faculty who understands the importance of sport and the importance of taking sport seriously. So this event is a collaborative sponsored endeavor of our, our three units and shippers and speaker funds. Each of our faculties voted <laughs> to bring Dr. Noah Cohen here to talk about his work because all of our faculties and shippers understand that sport matters. Um, so with that, I could talk here all day about this, but I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Cohen. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker and he's going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have ample time for a conversation and dialogue. So get those questions ready. If you're attending virtually over Zoom, please throw those in the Q&A or the chat, whichever function that may be. The Q and A. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to Rachel Bunning for setting this up and making it awesome. Things don't work in shippers without Rachel Bunning <laughs> and also Erica May, who both worked very hard to pull this together and, and get it promoted and get all the tech working and getting all of this organized. So thank you, Rachel. Um, so, <laughs> without any more further ado, um, Dr. Noah Cohen is an assistant director and lecturer of American Culture Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. His research and teaching are oriented to the intersection of American uh, fan culture, sports, and narratives, particularly as they pertain to race and gender. Dr. Cohen's book, We Average on Beautiful Watchers, Fan Narratives and the Reading of American Sports was published in July of 2019 by the University of Nebraska Press. He's the co-editor of Sport in the University, a special issue of the journal American Studies, 
um, that was in the fall of 2016, and he's the founding coordinator of the Sports Studies Caucus of the American Studies Association and co-convener of the AMCS Program Initiative in Sport and Society, Culture, Power, and Identity. And that last piece really speaks to how Dr. Cohen is one of these people who um, promotes sports studies um, across the United States um, in that role as founding coordinator of the Sports Studies Caucus at the American Studies Association, but in other ways, he's a connector. He's a person who brings sports studies folks together, reaching out and supporting others' work. And I'm very grateful for Noah for that um, portion of his commitment to um, sports studies. He's someone who wants to elevate this, but also get folks out and doing more public um, and advocacy work in their communities. And for that, I'm also very grateful for Noah. Um, and you're gonna love this presentation and especially um, both, we, we get a twofer. <laughs> we get to hear about Noah's book, um, which this was a talk scheduled for the spring of 2020. Um, but since it's been two years since then, we also get to hear about Noah's current project, Whereas Hoops, um, which is a, a, just exemplifies the type of work that sports study scholars can be doing to tap into their communities. So thank you very much um, for, for giving us a two for, for, the, the, for the price and time of one. Um, so thank you, Dr. Cohen. And I'm going to hand this off to you. You can attach this to your lapel. give this talk with a mask on, so I'm going to take it off for a little more. Okay. Hope the mic sounds good. Um, thank you so much, Victoria, for that lovely um, introduction. Thanks to the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies here at Arizona State University for its gener generous support in bringing me here. I'm so thrilled that um, Victoria didn't give up on me after um, events intervened to prevent me coming two years ago. Um, it's a real um, honor to be here, especially because, you know, Victoria just spent time um, saying nice things about me, but really Victoria is an inspiration to me, um, given her public facing work in sports studies, uh, writing for newspapers and other public facing publications. A lot of academics tend to, to write for each other. Um, and Victoria is um, great about speaking to a public audience and, and in, in uh, what a way that a lot of sports studies scholars would consider really brave, right? Talking about athletic labor as uh, uh, an NC on American uh, colleges and universities campuses and how we can make a more just and equitable um, uh, place of play and work for uh, student, student athletes as the NCAA would have us call them, uh, student athlete laborers as I might call them um, on campuses across our country. So, so it's a real uh, privilege to be here. I just taught uh, two of Victoria's articles to my uh, class on uh, contemporary issues in American sport. And they were uh, really inspired and, and learned a lot, especially about the Olympic movement as it relates to sport on campuses in the US. So it's a, it's, it's a thrill and you, you uh, inspire me to, to do some of the work, the kind of work that I'm gonna talk about today. Okay, let's dig into it. When this talk was originally planned, my book, We Average on Beautiful Watchers, Fan Narratives and the Reading of American Sports was still relatively new. Now it's almost three years old and its insights while still useful are not fresh, at, at least to me. Um, I've moved on to other scholarly projects. But when I started thinking about those projects and especially the one I'll talk about today, I realized that they do connect in some meaningful ways to particular insights gleaned from the book. So what I'll do as Victoria just mentioned uh, in this talk is give you a brief primer on the book and its sort of central claims. But then instead of going further and digging substantively into the novels, autobiographies, films, and blogs that I analyze uh, in the chapters of the book, um, I'll use one particular example to transition to talking about my current project. And that project has related arguments, but are very distinct rhetorical and material manifestations. But for now, let's start at the very beginning with the first half of the book's title the part in uh, all caps yellow, <laughs> um, and the larger quote that it comes from. Here we have a, an artistic rendering of, of the author that I was fond of. Um, here's, here's what he has to say. Here's a theory. Top athletes are compelling because they embody the comparison-based achievement we Americans revere. Fastest, strongest, and because they do so in a totally unambiguous way. 
Questions of the best plumber or the best managerial accountant are impossible even to define. Whereas the best relief pitcher, free throw shooter, or female tennis player is, at any given time, a matter of public statistical record. Top athletes fascinate us by appealing to our twin compulsions with competitive superiority and hard data. Plus, they're beautiful. Jordan hanging in midair like a Chagall bride, Sampras laying down a touch volley at an angle that defies Euclid, and they're inspiring. There is about world-class athletes carving out exemptions from physical laws, a transcendent beauty that makes manifest God and man. So actually more than one theory then, great athletes are profundity in motion. They enable abstractions like power and grace and control to become not only incarnate, but televisable. To be a top athlete performing is to be that exquisite hybrid of animal and angel that we average unbeautiful watchers have such a hard time seeing in ourselves. This quote is from David Foster Wallace's essay titled, How Tracy Austin Broke My Heart. In it, the not yet famous novelist reviewed the tennis phenom's autobiography, which is titled Beyond Center Court, My Story. Frustrated with the work, which Wallace called breathtakingly insipid, he tries to figure out just what it was that he had expected from a world-class athlete in the first place. Using Austin's words to better understand his own status as a rabid fan, Wallace attempts to explain why we average unbeautiful watchers are so both so compelled by athletic genius and so disappointed in athletes' inability to explain their own profundity. The essay made me feel like I could write a book on the subject of sports fans, because in it, Wallace manages to both articulate a lot of what makes sports so meaningful and also to flail around a little bit at the inherent multiplicity of how that meaning is made. He intuits, essentially, that there are quantitative and qualitative ways of thinking about sports, those being matters of public statistical record and transcendent beauty that makes manifest God in man, and that our dominant discourses rarely seem to consider them in tandem. It's no accident that he considers the former first. Matters of competitive superiority and hard data overdetermine how the media talks about sports, especially in our age of analytics. What's more, as I take pains to point out in the introduction to the book, this discursive emphasis on sports as quantitative affects how they are studied in the academy. As described by Kimberly Schimmel, C. Lee Harrington, and Denise Bealby in their 2007 uh, co-authored article, Keep Your Fans to Yourself, the Disjuncture Between Sports Studies and Pop Culture Studies Perspectives on Fandom, Sports fans have been extensively examined by scholars in disciplines like psychology, communications, and business, but unlike their brethren in media fandom, have not traditionally received much attention from scholars in the humanities. The beauty of athletes then, not to mention abstractions like power and grace and control, as Wallace puts it, are usually discounted or ignored when it comes to scholarly considerations of fans and their motivations. Which brings us in a roundabout way to narrative. A commonplace understanding of sports is primarily quantitative, as always measurable and perpetually measured, goes hand in hand with the notion that sporting events are real in a way that other narrative entertainments, novels, films, television, are not. The final score is not predetermined, or at least it's not supposed to be. And thus the athletes are not scripted in their performance. They are physically gifted, real people, not performers. This means ultimately that while journalists might write stories about sports, sporting events themselves are not usually considered narratives in a way those other entertainments are. And yet, as philosopher Aaron C. Tarver puts it, while fans believe themselves to be admiring people, they are doing no such thing. Rather, fans deeply felt attachments to the fates and achievements of people they do not know and have never met are attachments to something like the heroes of an epic narrative. Just as Odysseus's power to compel admiration in the Greeks is dependent more on the identification with him and reiteration of Homer's narrative than on the historical facts of a person called Odysseus, the admiration of sports heroes in this account tells us more about the audience than it does the person the audience is supposed to admire. Specifically, it tells us what sorts of traits they find admirable, 
and with what sorts of characters they prefer to identify and imagine themselves to be like. Harvard's assertion is rather uncommon in a traditional sports context. The idea that Colin Kaepernick, the person, is someone very different from Colin Kaepernick, the elite athletic icon and cultural flashpoint, would be rejected out of hand by most sports fans, whether they love or hate him and his political demonstration. The siren song of sports competitive reality is too strong, even if every game's journey progresses toward Ithaca. This idea that sports are fundamentally real and not story-based has even led some fans and journalists to use the word narrative in a derogatory manner, as seen here, to refer to the overlaying of artificial stories onto the physical performance that they understand as self-evidently meaningful. The best sports journalism, such terminology implies, is but a magnifying glass, providing a window onto the action below. Spend some time spend, uh, studying literature and literary theory, and you learn that this idea is nonsensical, of course. Humans cannot understand anything without narratives, and how we tell them determines in large part what they mean. Language constitutes our reality. So sporting events themselves are narratives. It's from this baseline presumption, unthinkable to some and obvious to others, that my book embarks. Focusing on the fan readers and what they make of those narratives, forms the basis of the chapters. Each chapter comes to a rather different assessment of fans' readerly capacities, in part because each one examines a different context, not only with regard to the sports those fans are interested in, but also the kinds of text in which they are depicted, or in the case of autobiographies and memoirs, depict themselves in. Here's, here's the transition point in the talk. In chapter three, which is titled Race in the Basketball Memoir, Fan Identity and the Eros of a Black Man's Game. One of the authors whose memoirs I consider is this man, John Edgar Weidman, and his 2001 book, Hoop Roots, Playga Playground Basketball, Love and Race. Unlike most of the texts considered in my book, which focus on fans of professional sports, Weidman's memoir is premised on the notion that playground hoop, not the professional game, is the truest, most impactful version of what basketball can be, especially for people of color. As literary critic Tracy Church Guzio puts it, quote, or sorry, playground ball, quote, functions as an expressive space that Weidman uses to play, to criticize, to celebrate, to analyze African-American experience, end quote. Weidman, who starred as an all Ivy forward at the University of Pennsylvania, reveres the game for its embodied performance. And he particularly values, quote, how relentlessly, scrupulously the playground game encloses and defines moments, end quote. This contrasts starkly with his own experience, writing autobiography, looking back, trying to recall and represent yourself at some point in the past in which you are playing many games simultaneously. There are many selves many sets of rules jostling for position. None offers the clarifying cleansing unity of playing hoop. Ultimately, Weidman relates the frustrating multiplicity of writerly consciousness to that of the fan, urging his reader to pity the poor writer. He or she's a bench warmer, a kind of made up spectator who may or may not be spectating the game in front of his face or other games, other places, other times, or a mixture of the actual of memory, wishes, dreams of game, a fictitious fan. Basketball spectatorship, unlike participation, seems to Weidman to be passive, prone to perversions of history born of fans' desires. The consumerist narrative that the NBA provides is particularly problematic in this regard, offering, as he puts it, the media-driven vicarious virtual possession of a black body as a mode of self-aggrandizing power better than buying a slave with all the attendant burdens without, uh, oh yeah, with all the attendant burdens of ownership and one that allows white men to, who crave transgression to represent bad without worrying about paying the dues bad black boys pay, poverty, jail, apartheid, early graves. Denaturalizing white supremacy for white men requires conscious attention to the ways in which black people are de-individualized and objectified in the common narratives of the white public's imagination. 
And spectator sports is one of the avenues in which such objectification is most obviously normalized. Weidman understands and points out, in other words, that the tens, if not hundreds of millions of Americans celebrating the narratives of black athletes and black athletic triumph on television do nothing to positively impact the day-to-day -day lives of black Americans struggling with the material realities of centuries of inequality. Without perhaps really realizing it, I internalized Weidman's insights. And as I'm sure you've guessed by now, it is from them that my latest project has emerged. Though as a white cisgendered heterosexual man, I have always been privileged. And as an only occasional hooper with no organized basketball experience, I can't hold a candle to Weidman's hoop pedigree. But as someone who has studied the history of segregation, redlining and the sporting landscape in St. Louis, I have long known that the material reality of pickup basketball in my adopted home city reflects the kind of racist pathologies that Weidman asserts undergirds white Americans' NBA narrative-driven desires, those being for the vicarious virtual possession of a black body that allows them to represent bad without worrying about paying dues bad black boys pay. All right, let me show you what I mean. This is a map of the publicly available outdoor basketball facilities um, that are in the city of St. Louis. You can see the Mississippi River running here on the east side and the city limits are about here. <clears throat> you may notice a preponderance of red arrows in this portion of the map. That's the north side of the city. Uh, that preponderance results, as you might guess, from systemic racism, along with its right hand in city planning, redlining. In St. Louis, this race-based residential division is known as the Del Mar Divide for the street Del Mar Boulevard, which functions as the dividing line. I've delineated the line, helpfully in red for you on the map. Though, of course, uh, redlining is no longer actively practiced, a demographic map of St. Louis starkly uh, demonstrates the continuing reality. The area north of Del Mar is almost exclusively inhabited by Black people while the area south of it is most, mostly white. So you can see that the parks, city parks department, no doubt in conjunction with various power brokers in the mayor's office and elsewhere, has allowed the sport of basketball's popular association with blackness to determine how it allocates basketball facilities. Lest you think this uh, stereotype potentially benefits the black community, you need only look at the pictures of these facilities on the city of St. Louis's website, some of which reveal potentially productive playing environments, but many of which do not. But rather than focus on the basketball facilities that are present, whatever state they may be in, I'm more interested in the reasons for them being absent elsewhere. In particular, I've in particular, I have come to focus on this large green rectangle at the western edge of the city, which you'll notice has no red arrows in it. This is Forest Park. And Forest Park is someplace St. Louis likes to brag about. It's bigger than Central Park, goes the common refrain. There's so much to do and almost all of it is free. This is true from the Dwight Davis Tennis Center to the St. Louis Art Museum, from the not one, but two golf courses to the Missouri History Museum, and from the St. Louis Zoo to the myriad trails and green spaces. It's easy to see why Forest Park is often called St. Louis's crown jewel. The park's 1,371 acres easily outpaces Central Park in New York, which checks in at 843. And with so many amenities, it's no wonder so many residents are proud and visitors are impressed. And yet, despite sporting facilities designed for use in pursuits as various as archery, baseball, softball, cricket, handball, ice skating, rugby, football, and soccer, tennis and pickleball, paddle bowing, canoeing, and kayaking, there is nary a basketball hoop to be found. Not in 1904 for the World's Fair, not in the mid 20th century when St. Louis had multiple NBA and ABA teams, not in 2021, not as I have come to find out 
ever. Forest Park is located south of Del Mar, but it is open to all St. Louisans and black people do use the park. But I ask black park users why there are no basketball facilities in the park, as I have, and the reason is crystal clear to them. Let's see if the audio works. In other words, the powers that be do not want large groups of black people and young black men in particular hanging out in the park. Though people of all races and ethnicities play basketball, of course, the sports uh, association with outstanding black athletes at the collegiate and NBA levels has led to the game becoming a cultural marker of blackness. Hence the notion, build hoops and black people will come. Insofar as basketball would fun function similarly in Forest Park, the park's power brokers have clearly preferred to render the game invisible. I noticed basketball's glaring absence from Forest Park and surmised its racist implications not long after I moved to St. Louis in 2006. But it was not until much later, having written in We Average on Beautiful Watchers about sports fans' fundamental disconnection from the actual human beings who provide their narrative entertainment, having seen the St. Louis region's legacies of racism reignited in the wake of the murder of Michael Brown and all that took place in Ferguson, Missouri, which is just 10 miles north of Forest Park. And having had the rhythms and priorities of my daily life upended by the global COVID-19 pandemic, only after all that did I resolve to do something more than just notice that there were no parks, uh, hoops in the park. Sure, I could write and talk about it as I'm doing here, but that somehow seemed insufficient. As an anti-racist ally, I wanted to do something about it, not just point it out to other white people. To put it in Weidman's terms, I didn't want to be the poor writer who is to be pitied, but one who moves from reflection to action. Fortunately, I found a collaborator, John Early, a faculty member in the Sam Fox School of Art and Design at WashU, who is not only similarly inclined, but is also an artist with a vision for creatively communicating the problem to an audience beyond academia, including the powers that be. Together, we have created Whereas Hoops, a multimedia project that tells the story of basketball in Forest Park in St. Louis at large, and attempts to make visible all the power lines of race, class, and gender that connect them. The name Whereas Hoops is inspired by the language of St. Louis aldermanic board bills like this one, two of which have been introduced in the last five years proposing to install basketball facilities in Forest Park. Both of them died mysteriously in committee. And you can see here, this is one of them, board bill 36 from 2017. The word whereas, as you can see here in all caps, is used to begin a board bill or similar proclamation. The word used as such connotes consequence. Because the following things are true, I proclaim that something should happen. But it also has another conflicting meaning while on the contrary. Whereas hoops is built on just such attention, one built into the basketball landscape of the gateway city. Whereas basketball has no presence in Forest Park, we celebrate the game's long history in St. Louis. In this sentence, whereas can fulfill both of its meanings, it is both true that basketball is formally absent from the park and that this formal absence marks the park 
such that once you notice it, the game becomes more present for being obviously denied. The scope of our research also extends beyond Forest Park to include the larger frame of St. Louis, a city that hasn't hosted a top level men's professional team in 45 years. Despite that absence, this city has a rich history of hoops excellence, both at the professional level, I showed you a couple of pictures earlier, and at the collegiate level. Here you can see a news clipping from 1948 when St. Louis University won the NIT tournament, which at that time was actually a more prestigious tournament than the NCAA tournament. So this would have been, they would have been considered national champions. Uh, St. Louis also has a thriving prep scene that produced 2021 Olympic gold medalists, Jason Tatum and Nafisa Collier. Bradley Beal is also pictured here, also from St. Louis. He was not able to participate in the Olympics because he tested positive for COVID, but he's another St. Louis prep star who went on to NBA success. What does this all mean on practical terms? Okay, well, this is where the pandemic factors in even more heavily. Though John and I had had a conversation about what scholar activism could look, look like as far back as 2016, it wasn't until we were trapped at home in the early days of the pandemic that we, we finally and fully recognized that the perfect idea is the enemy of the good. So in early 2021, we did a, a, an easy thing, a thing that any of you could do in about five minutes with your phones. Uh, we made an Instagram account. So I wanna show you a little bit about this account. This is a screenshot um, I'm in my presentation, but if I can, I'm gonna break from my presentation and just, if my web access is still working, and it is, show you a little bit about this account. So we started um, just about a year ago and there's a few different kinds of posts. There are sort of history posts where we talk about the St. Louis Bombers, for example, which were an early NBA team in 1949 that existed in St. Louis. And we talk about, um, oh, one of my favorite things is the history of the Fort Shaw Indian School women's basketball team that did not play basketball in the park. <laughs> but in 1904, St. Louis hosted the World's Fair and adjacent to the park on what is now the campus of Washington University in St. Louis, not far from my office actually, they had a, a what was called a model Indian school. And this was a racist institution that tried to strip native peoples of their culture, right? To so-called kill the Indian, save the man, right? And they often would teach these uh, Indian uh, Native American students sort of um, white Western cultural uh, traditions. Well, one thing that they, they taught these particular women was the game of basketball. And they came to St. Louis as a, a skilled team that had played together before. And they ran the table on every, all comers, all the women who came to face them. They went undefeated. And so they went from being a kind of object of a sort of racist curiosity, right? Um, and there was a lot of racism going on at the 1904 World's Fair to being celebrated as, as uh, women's world champions. No such competition existed at the time, but because they ran the table at the World's Fair, they were given this trophy and, and dubbed uh, the champions of the world in 1904. So that gives you an, a, an idea of some of the things that we do. Um, we also uh, feature, of course, uh, artworks by my colleague, uh, John Early. Here's one, Forest Park for Whom. Here's another in which he imagines a basketball hoop at the site of the <laughs> Uh, outside during the uh, 1904 Olympics, which were in St. Louis as part of the World's Fair. So we've tried a lot of different things. There are these videos, like the one I showed you earlier of talking to people in the park and our hoops installation, which I'll talk about in a minute. We've tried to keep the content uh, varied for, for engagement and it's been a really refreshing way to, to share scholarly work. Okay, back to the presentation. So starting by tracing the history of the park and featuring some of John's artwork, we gradually began to expand our efforts to include regular forays into the park to connect with St. Louisans and ask them, why aren't there basketball facilities here when there are so many other sporting amenities? What does that say about who is and isn't welcome in the park? Um, we also constructed, as I mentioned just a second ago, our own mobile hoop attached to the back of John's minivan. Uh, which we regularly bring into the park to show people that hoops would be a natural fit in St. Louis's crown jewel. And this is one of my favorite shots. We drove it up right in front of the art museum. <laughs> the art museum is one of the only surviving original buildings from the World's Fair in 1904. 
Um, as far as we can tell, our first mobile hoop exhibition, which took place on June 5th, 2021, marked the first time anyone played basketball in Forest Park, in the park, in its 445-year history. And as I think you saw earlier uh, from perusing the Instagram account, befitting the stereotype of two middle-aged men, John and I have also launched a podcast <laughs> uh, featuring uh, experts on basketball history, St. Louis history, and also artists who are interested in the game and its aesthetic manifestations. If you're a real hoop head, I really recommend following Pro Hoops History. You can find it on Instagram and Twitter. It's this man, Curtis Harris, uh, Dr. Curtis Harris, PhD, and uh, he does excellent work tracing the history of the NBA that maybe the NBA doesn't want to necessarily tell you about. So he's a great social media follow, I highly recommend. Perhaps most importantly, we've managed to connect with local parks officials and elected representatives on the Forest Park Advisory Board. The Forest Park Advisory Board is a public-private partnership between the city of St. Louis's Parks Department, which oversees all the parks and this one as well, but also a, a nonprofit, a large nonprofit called Forest Park Forever, which is funded by some of St. Louis's wealthiest citizens, which is part of the reason the park is so well maintained because there's this other uh, nonprofit behind it. And I'll talk some more about St. Louis's wealthiest citizens in a moment. But our ultimate goal is to make an impact on the built environment of Forest Park, right? Not just to talk about this issue, raise awareness, right? But to actually garner enough support to make basketball hoops a welcoming presence rather than a glaring absence in the park landscape. To do that, we'll need to continue to gather the support of the city and park officials, as well as plenty of ordinary St. Louisans, a task that will take plenty of time and concentrated effort. We're in this for the long haul. And one way which we're carrying out that effort uh, most recently is through the creation of a self-published artist's book, a medium that enhances and extends a text through the rich and unconventional interplay of word image and publication design. Generously supported by a grant from Wash U's own Center for Race, Ethnicity and Equity, and loosely based on the formatting conventions of the board bills that we saw earlier, used by the Board of Aldermen. This limited edition volume, which is actually being printed and collated, being put together as we speak, is conceived of as an evocative series of textual and visual whereas statements that provide the background context and motivation for the construction of basketball hoops and courts in Forest Park. Content for the publication comes from, as you might guess, the writings, research, and interviews and visuals that we've posted on the project's Instagram feed. Our hope is that the imaginative and speculative space within the artist book will open up new ways of considering the issues at hand and help us envision a future in which basketball in Forest Park is a reality. There are already positive signs of that future on the horizon. Notably, with the urging uh, from John and myself at a series of planning meetings, the Forest Park Advisory Board has progressed three steps into a nine-step planning process toward the construction of courts in the North Central Park of Forest Park near the Visitor's Center. John helpfully made this graphic for us. The blue represents how far we are. The green mostly happens behind closed doors, including coming up with the preliminary design, which will be important, and culminates with public input. More on this in a moment. After that, then we progress to stages seven through nine. <clears throat> so currently we're somewhere in four through six. We're not exactly sure where. <laughs> if the wheels of bureaucracy turn unimpeded, this could mean that basketball hoop installation could begin in Forest Park in spring 2023. Despite this, um, seemingly definitive and I think overly optimistic headline from St. Louis's local NPR affiliate. There are significant obstacles remaining, most notably the two required periods of public comment, which given the court's proposed location here, right here, the visitor center is here, the Dwight Davis Tennis Center is here, this is the St. Louis History Museum, and this is Lindell Boulevard, which happens to be home of some of the biggest mansions and wealthiest residents in all of St. Louis. <clears throat> so they're proposing to put courts essentially just a few dozen yards from the mansions of, of some of St. Louis wealthiest residents. And we anticipate that these periods of public comment could be fraught with racism uh, and fear mongering essentially at the prospect of basketball happening in close proximity to where they live. 
John and I hope to marshal the support of Whereas Hoops followers to counter any such opposition, to demonstrate the legacy of racial inequity and injustice that the lack of hoops inescapably represents on the one hand, and to display the generative, joyful, community building possibilities that the game of basketball can provide people of all races, classes, genders, and sexual orientations. So the path to hoops, while open, isn't without obstacles, and I suspect that navigating it won't be easy. But I am hopeful, after all, it was just five years ago that a Confederate monument, a racist presence in Forest Park for 103 years, was removed thanks to the efforts of local activists. Not only that, but the road leading to the monument, which was called Confederate Drive, was ripped up and replaced with grass. It's like this road never existed. It's, it's remarkable. <clears throat> the absence of basketball courts is not an equivalent offense to a monument overtly celebrating the, the uh, white supremacist lost cause. But it is, I would argue, a kind of echo of that sentiment, a reminder that many white people still prefer spaces where people of color, if not kept entirely absent, are represented only as a small minority. It's time to change that attitude, to show St. Louisans that we will all benefit when Forest Park is a more welcoming and equitable place for all. Then the park will be someplace to brag about and play hoops in. So to wrap things up by returning to my book, <clears throat> you might say that in Whereas Hoops, I'm attuned to the narratives that we average unbeautiful watchers read into sport and how false and unhelpful narratives impact real people and even, as in this case, physical environments. In this case, the racist narrative that black men are inherently criminal and dangerous to other park goers has actively deterred the powers that be from installing hoops in the park since at least the 1960s. This narrative is nonsense, of course, and we need and what we need to fight it, in addition to physical hoops themselves, is more better narratives about the beauty of basketball and the inherent dignity of black people. Black playground basketball culture is a thing. It's a real thing. Anyone who knows anything about Rucker Park knows this is, this is a thing, but it is something to be celebrated, not feared. Furthermore, the idea that only black men would use the courts is so narrow-minded as to be nonsensical. Basketball is for everyone, whether you are black, white, Asian, or Latino, man, woman, or non-binary, gay, straight, of any sexual orientation. Whether, you, whether what you most appreciate about sport are matters of public statistical record, transcendent beauty that makes manifest God in man, or like David Foster Wallace, can't quite make up your mind. Thank you. would really be happy to take any questions you may have. Sure. Uh, what types of sports media do you consume? What about a Bill Simmons hoops fan as much as anything that hoops fandom ends up being in the white narrative? Hmm. <laughs> I do write briefly about Bill Simmons in my book. <laughs> and he has made quite an evolution from uh, a part-time columnist for an AOL uh, <laughs> website in the late 90s to a multi-billionaire, thanks to Spotify. Um, the, the every fan appeal is, uh, every fan uh, writerly uh, sort of position is one with a lot of appeal and it attracts a lot of eyeballs. I mean, I think the, the most um, obvious current example of this might be Barstool Sports. There's a lot of presumptions about whiteness, about straightness, and about the role of women in sport that comes along with that, that uh, writerly perspective. And I think Simmons has distanced himself from that somewhat in his maturity, but certainly in his early days, he wrote a lot of really racist, sexist things about who sports is for and who should get to participate in it. And that's part of what I write about in my book. Is in, I look at his book, The Book of Basketball, uh, which is a really comprehensive look at basketball history in a lot of ways, and, and it has a lot of really Parts of it, are a, lot, a lot of parts of it are really worth praising, but it also has a lot of really cringe-worthy, really racist parts and, and um, sexist uh, commentary used for humor as well. So I think um, the question of what, what that represents or what the possibilities of, uh, 
the, what the possibilities are for fandom. I think if we, if we think of fandom as that only, that's really limiting because I think fandom is a lot more robust community than, than a lot of people think. I think a lot of people who don't like sports think sports fandom is only that. And if it were only that, they would be right to reject it. But, but sports like basketball is so much more robust than that. And I think that those of us who are sports fans who are more inclusive, who are hoping to make a, a better sporting space for the athletes and the fans um, are well served to, to push back against those that would um, consider that the sort of model for what sports fandom is or can be. Yeah. <laughs> the, the interwebs are, are bounteous and uh, you know, if you want to um, peruse Jeff Bezos's website, you can buy it there, but I recommend using um, IndieBound or one of those other uh, websites that will support your local bookseller, but it's out there. University of Nebraska Press came out in 2019. And just for the questions that are in the room, where can you buy the book? Oh yes, he asked where I can buy my book, <laughs> and the answer is the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring any copies, or I'd hand you one right now. <laughs> any other questions? All right. My question is sort of half formed, so. It take me a minute to get there, but I'm interested in the way that you, the idea of kind of athletes as characters in a narrative that we are busy reading, um, seems to me, you know, you've, you've mentioned it as a, or you've considered it as a way of thinking more critically or more scholarly, in a more scholarly way about sports and narrative and how it operates. But it's my sense that actually, one of the things that kind of scholarship is especially about literature does is treat as unserious that connection to character, right? That, you know, identifying with or relating to is profoundly uncritical, right? It keeps you from being able to. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can, I, again, this is where it's half formed. Mm -hmm. is, is there a way that, um, you know, despite all the kind of negative attention that sports as narrative gets in popular press, that those kind of un, unprofessional assumptions about how we read narratives actually make us kind of open up new ways of reading that aren't kind of foreclosed. One, one that maybe is why so many humanities scholars haven't treated sports as narrative in the way that you do. All right, I will try to restate this question. <laughs> the, the, the literature PhD has entered the chat. Um, I also share this ignominious distinction. Um, I think what you were saying was something about how literary study would view connection, the sort of emotional connection to the character as unserious, right? And therefore, you know, um, asserting that sporting events themselves are narrative might be limiting in terms of how we understand fan connection is that is that okay <laughs> um i guess i don't have a great answer to that except to that to say um i think i early on in my work on this book and this book comes out of work i was doing in graduate school so it's it's material i've been thinking about for a dozen years but um i i gravitated toward um toward media fan studies because media fan studies had already sort of had these battles, right? They had essentially said, look, the emotional resonance is there. They anticipated sort of what Rita, Rita Felsky says about inevitable emotional connection and not rejecting that. They, they sort of had already gone over that ground before that book came out. So I sort of gravitated toward their scholarship to provide the baseline for that assertion. Um, I, 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 sort, I guess I sort of felt my bigger battle was just to get to the point where people could, I could show people that I think sports themselves are narratives and, and sort of chose that battle as one that I could rest on the laurels of, of others <laughs> and sort of say that, just not spend time arguing about it. Just say, you know, you can, you can believe that critical distance is a necessary thing for um, uh, sort of meaningful analysis if you want. But I just reject that out of hand. Like we're all emotionally invested in our projects, no matter what they are. Even if you're a chemist, there's some piece of you that's in that's in the research that you're doing. And so I think it's nonsense to pretend otherwise. Um, I 
presentation, by the way. But I feel like a lot of what we're talking about right now, um, there's a lot of really big words right now. So a lot of this is like focused in academia, and it's stuff I'm used to listening to and hearing. But I know if I were bringing my friends in here, they'd be like, what's that saying? Um, so like with your book, are you using these type of this kind of language, this kind of rhetoric, or are you making it more accessible to people? And if not, but it's more like based or the you know sort of academia. You have a way to make that knowledge accessible to other people, like these like things we're talking about right now. So he's asking about the the sort of uh, scholarly lingo that's heavy in in sort of my presentation and whether that's reflected in the book. Uh, I would I would pose a counter question to you before answering, which is like, did you detect a difference between the part of the talk that was about my book and the part of the talk that was about whereas hoops? A little bit. Actually, <laughs> the, I mean, there's a little less seriousness when you're just bringing on like a basketball hoop and you're, you're having fun and whatnot. Um, that, that's one thing that I, I worry about is um, like the kind of historical feel around Halloween teacher because I'm mm -hmm. like, I caught up in uh, using the scholarly lingo and whatnot, but I realize a lot of people doesn't resonate well and it was just really fast as soon as you start yep. bringing up these topics like that. Mm -hmm. So he's wondering about losing audience if you if you get too down in the weeds and sort of critical conversation. So um, I, I thank you. I, I mean, I think what I was getting at was is a matter of audience, right? The, the book, as I said, came out of graduate work. And when you're doing graduate work in literary, literary studies, which I was, you're not really generally writing for a public audience. A lot of academics like to pretend that's what they're doing, but really they're talking to other academics, right? And the books that they publish are not generally widely read because they're not intended to be widely read, right? So, you know, I knew when I wrote this book that, you know, as much as I tried to make it publicly accessible, I wasn't going to be able to rip all of that out of it. Part of the critical architecture of the points that I'm making relies on some of that scholarly lingo. So part of the urgency of what I'm doing with Whereas Hoops, part of the transition that I'm sort of trying to make, part of the point of doing this as an Instagram account and a hoop that we take in the park, right, is to do work that does speak to the public, right? Um, I hope that if you can get through the density of what I was saying in the first half of the, the, the presentation, you can see how that actually relates also to the more public facing work. But it's okay if you can't, because part of what part of the awakening that I had, as I, as I mentioned in the talk, was to, to try to make some of the insights that I've gleaned with regard to race, with regard to fandom, more obvious to an audience that isn't going to read an academic book. And there, there are a lot of really great thinkers and talkers doing some of this work. I, uh, as long as I'm making recommendations, I already recommended Curtis Harris, who has a PhD, but his, his work at Pro Hoops History is very public facing, um, very digestible. Um, the Burn It All Down podcast, if you're looking for a feminist take on, on sport, um, there are several academics as part of that collective, but it's definitely public facing. Really great work. So there are, there are people out there who are taking some of the insights that we can glean from from academic reading, writing, and scholarship, and and translating it for a public audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for those listening in, he asked, uh, being an international student, he was a little unfamiliar with um, some of the, the racial geography that I showed of St. Louis and was hoping that I could go over some of that again. So I can, uh, yeah, I can go back to that slide. Let's see. Just going to skip backwards. <laughs> I suppose this would have been faster if I had just navigated to the slide, but I'm committed at this point. Yeah, okay, we're almost there. <laughs> no, this is farther than I thought. Oh, no, now I have to go through all the red bubbles. All right, we're, we're erasing all the red bubbles. Okay, here we go, here we go. Okay. So, um, so redlining was a practice that was practiced widely in this country, um, you know, after the Civil War and slavery was abolished. 
uh, it was effectively a way in which white people would prevent black people or any people of color, you know, could be any race or ethnicity other than your of European origin from living in their neighborhoods. So they would write into the sort of covenant of their neighborhoods that only uh, people of European descent were allowed to live there. And this is pervasive in many, many American cities across the United States. Um, eventually, these were struck down as illegal, right? The Supreme Court and other uh, judicial bodies said that this is illegal. But as I point out in this map, uh, even if it becomes illegal, that doesn't change where people are living and it's hard to you know, get the communities to fully integrate, right? So because of that legacy of redlining, um, this area is almost entirely populated by people of African descent, right? And down here is majority white. There's people of all kinds of races and ethnicities, but it's majority white. So the, the color blue represents European ancestry and the color green represents African ancestry, right? Um, so the point about the basketball hoop, the preponderance of basketball hoops up on the north side of the city has to do with the, the stereotype, as I was talking about earlier, that black people love basketball and basketball is for black people to play, right? So the, the, the ramifications of that are twofold. The city would be naturally inclined to build basketball courts where black people live, but also at the behest of white people in the white area of the map would not build basketball courts because those white people are informed by the, the racist presumption that black men will come and they will be criminals and it will ruin their neighborhoods, right? So, so that's why there's only a few uh, publicly available outdoor basketball facilities on the south side of the city. And as you can see, even on the south side, there are some neighborhoods in here that have more of a greenish tint to them. <laughs> it's again, where black people are living and not over here as much where most of the white, and here's Forest Park, right? Right here, not a red arrow in a, you know, like a mile and a half radius from the center of the park. So that's, that's part of how the racialized geography and the assumptions about race when, with regard to basketball specifically manifest on the physical landscape of the city. Does that help? Do you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and black swimmers who try to desegregate places that are supposed to be allowed to swim in and met with violence. Yes. So the, the violence is where bodies are on display <laughs> um, in mixed gender settings um, historically. So the basketball part is something I think there's been more focus on swimming pools mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the basketball is a, a fascinating addition. Yeah, for those watching online, um, Victoria has been telling us about swimming pools related legacy with regard to racist racism and racist assumptions about, about black people and black bodies. Um, and St. Louis, you know, as she alluded to, but I can speak more specifically about was home to one of the most notorious pool riots in the country in 1949, I think, uh, called the Fairgrounds Park pool riot. Fairgrounds Park was a, a park in a part of the city that in which white flight was happening. So it had been previously a white neighborhood, but white people were leaving because black people were moving in. So at that time it was relatively racially mixed and they uh, desegregated the swimming pool. The swimming pool had been for whites only. And um, when black people attempted to use the pool, a riot started in which white people started beating up black youth, not only the ones who were using the pool, but anyone who happened to walk by out of rage that their facility would be integrated. And actually, <laughs> Um, one of the most interesting minutia about that riot that I find quite telling is that uh, Fairgrounds Park was not far from Sportsman's Park. Sportsman's Park is where the St. Louis Cardinals played. And there was a Cardinals game that night, the night of the pool riot. And there are eyewitnesses who report that um, Cardinals fans who are riding the trolley line to go to the baseball game instead, these are white people, instead went to the Fairgrounds Park to join in in, in the riot. Um, so the sort of whiteness or, or perceived whiteness of sporting spaces in that case crossed over from <laughs> baseball to, um, to swimming. 1949, of course, after Jackie Robinson had broken baseball's color line, but still before the Cardinals had any black players. I believe the Browns, St. Louis Browns, which also existed at that time, may have had a black player, but 
The Cardinals did not. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question was about uh, whether I've received any negative feedback um, on, you, you, you mentioned the book, but really I think is more pertinent to the Whereas Hoops project, which isn't a book yet. We're making an artist book out of it, but um, the, 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 we, we average on beautiful watchers, uh, no. <laughs> I don't think enough people have read it. <laughs> so um, if you wanna make some people mad on the internet, um, maybe that'd be good because then <laughs> more people might read it. <laughs> um, but as for the Whereas Hoops project, um, you know, in working with the Forest Park Advisory Board, um, they've said all the right things. You know, they're like, oh, right, yeah, we should have basketball. Oh, totally, and of course you're right. You know, they haven't pushed back yet. Um, but I'm interested to see when we get to those neighbors and things, when we get to people who are um, invested in our particular idea of who the park is for, what will happen. Um, you know, we've had a little, on social media, there have been some hints of, of resistance on certain articles about hoops coming to the park. There's been some racist discourse, but none of it has been directed directly at us so far. And part of that's privilege for two white dudes doing this thing. I mean, we're, we know that we're trying to be allies and, you know, we try to elevate black voices always in doing this work, but we also feel like, um, you know, there's a role for us to play in, in making this argument and pointing it out to white people who might not listen to a, a black voice saying the same thing. So. Yeah, Victoria. I, I have a follow-up question to that. Are you going to record the public commentary? Is this like a public event <laughs> where there's public comments? Because one thing that was wild, I've mean, spent a lot of time looking at the history of school segregation and the ongoing effort to keep public schools segregated and public play spaces too, but public schools especially, was um, um, the, the battles over desegregating public schools, which inevitably lead to moments when people tell you the things they normally would never say out loud. You hear those things out loud in mm -hmm. school board meetings. Yep. And I'm thinking about, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who before the 1619 project was focusing the majority of her journalistic efforts on school segregation and desegregation efforts. And had recorded a school board meeting in Ferguson, Missouri, where it's like wild that people think this thing mm -hmm. people say in public mm -hmm. um, in opposition to the school desegregation. So with that context, <laughs> is it a public meeting that yes. has a commentary period? And will you do their recording? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, the question was about the, the public comment period of the approval process and whether we will be able to record it. I don't know whether that event will be on Zoom or in person because of the pandemic that depends. Of course, in times past, it's been an in-person event. And so I don't really know how well attended these things are. Um, I do know that the, the, the hoops do have the support of the older woman who represents the people who live in those mansions, but I don't think that's any guarantee. Uh, we did famously in this ex exact neighborhood, you may recall um, some Black Lives Matter protesters were on their way to the mayor's house to demonstrate and um, the McCluskey uh, husband and wife team came out heavily armed and threatened threatened all the protesters with their AR-15s. And, and that was this exact neighborhood. That's, that's this same set of mansions. So that doesn't necessarily mean that, that there'll be a lot of resistance at when these public meetings do happen, but I think we need to be prepared for that to be the case. Any other questions?